through some of the parts of Johann Sebastian Bach's prelude from the cello suite number one usually and it was written in in G major but that doesn't allow us to get down into the kinds of writing he did in the lower register with beautiful dominant chord inversions with the, the seventh in the bass and things like that he has a low C string on the cello so I've moved it up to B major so as to get those low notes accurately in the relationships that he's written. If you've not yet done so, I would ask you to do please subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the content. You can like, share, and leave a comment. If you're really enjoying the content and would like to leave me a tip, that would be very nice. My PayPal information is in the description below. And we'll get started here just looking at some parts very informally, most likely with many mistakes of Johann Sebastian Bach's prelude from Cello Suite Number 1. So the first thing in getting it on the instrument is fingerings and what kind of timbre you're after. So this opening phrase, which I'm phrasing this way, on the 6th, 5th, and 3rd strings, you could do it on the 5th, 4th, and 3rd strings, Or you could do it on the fifth, fourth, and second strings. But these, the brightness of this and the, the guitar range part of this, I'm not crazy about. I like the, the darkness of that, even compared to that. So I like this root and fifth right next to each other on the sixth and fifth string. This little power chord. I talked about it in an earlier part one of this series that this is one of nature's chords here, where we have notes appearing as they appear in the overtone series. The root, then the fifth, and then the third. So what we need is, for this line, to rise up. And what's really happening is this D note is rising up the last part of a tetrachord of a major scale. There's that D. Now E. I'm saying E. I'm thinking of the chord quality. It's a G sharp note from F sharp to G sharp. usually have to let off by then, but I'm letting it ring out. The guitar's voice is pretty small otherwise. Sometimes I'm changing the, the timbre of where I'm picking by moving closer to the bridge or closer to the fingerboard. that note is going to go up to A sharp. And then it's going to make a rise to the octave of where we began. Now this part was a little tricky because kind of flange bar with the third finger. There wasn't time to do a separate finger if I wanted to play it at any tempo. So I do use the third finger and I, what George Van Epps called breaking back the knuckles. So I'm on 
the pad of my third finger and then on the tip. And I'm still staining this B underneath. Very nice line. It sounds like G sharp minor to me in first inversion. But he doesn't do the whole cycle of of what we've done before. Now it's broken. It's going to go into a run. So this this phrase we're going to have things like it throughout the piece. But here's. Uh, now you can hear what's the C sharp seven chord. And here I'm trying to control the length of these bass pitches. You see me rocking the hand a little bit. That's C sharp seven in first inversion. And now, instead of, as I pointed out in part one, instead of coming from root position there, he comes from the third of the chord. Now I had to figure out how to get down because the next thing, I think in part one I was fingering this G sharp minor thing this way. I eventually came up with, but I had to figure out how do I get my hand, which was once here, where in terms of placement, the other fingers are above the first finger, so they're towards the bridge. I had to figure out how do I get it to where my fingers are all below my third and fourth fingers off to the headstock. So what I came up with was shifting with my little finger second finger where my third finger is to get little uh, C sharp seven flat seven and then we have to reach up here to the to the fourth degree so I think of these as uh, groups of four one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then I'm up here. Uh, so this. I like playing this part. It, we're descending the scale, but we're rising up the fingerboard. Then we get this little jockeying between chord tones. get with actually it's the, it's from the same position towards the end of the piece we do get it here he starts to to hint at it there that kind of motif of jumping back and forth. So I like this sound a lot. This is, in terms of pitch, the fifth, the root, the third, the fifth, the root. So you could do a whole study of taking that up and down through the key. And 
know it's I always remember this is a John Coltrane line one two three five right giant steps kind of line so one two three five four three two one and then always a nice part of the piece for me I have to shift so that last note three one two and now we're going to get some diminished action very beautiful compact phrase and now I did a video on this about line contour so this was C sharp minor, then a little diminished, and these are, some of them are hammered. I like getting to this part of the piece because just some, some interesting stops are going to happen soon. scale run that was that's F sharp 7 first inversion flat 7 and root F sharp 7 to shift somewhere to get down here and I seem to shift differently all the time. Now I like this part. So this is down in the cello range where we wouldn't have this if we were tuned differently or uh, doing it in G. I don't know how people that are in D do it. I haven't. When they lower the E string to D, I don't know if they'd be able to get, maybe they'd be able to get these voicings still. I haven't looked into it because I don't like to retune my guitar and I want to stay as close as I can to understanding what I play on standard tuning without any adjustments and I don't like to be piece specific. I always want to be addressing this instrument the way it is in standard tuning. I did altered tunings and open tunings for a long time but have finally just come to okay I'm just going to get completely familiar with where everything is here and it's my home here. So. Shift. So it's another one where we're jumping a sixth. And I talked about this last time about muting as needed with first or second finger. And now I like this. So it's this nice reach. Uh, if you're familiar with, as I pointed out in another video, that those kinds of three note per string legato fingerings, then that's where we are. We do it two times and then it's just an arpeggio. And it's the first real break. Some cellists pause quite a while here. So that's a one whole beautiful line. I usually use the shift there. And 
there. Now we get one of these beautiful half step above things, it's going to become more and more a feature of what's going to happen in the piece. Coming down an arpeggio and back up with a little tag, and now we have running a triad. I have to leave these notes but mute them. So right there, second finger is coming up and doing some muting. And then for this finger I decided I'm going to use for a B chord, I'm going to roll my first finger off of near the the first this knuckle joint into the pad and then into the tip. Sorry. slide down and now slide up because I have to get here if before I was going jumping so a lot of this is pre-planning your positions and fingerings so that you're not in an awkward place as much as possible shift and now we have a big beautiful line Straight dominant chord in reverse, seven, five, three, seven, five, three, two, one. We've reached another kind of arrival point at the four chord. Now we're solely in the, we're really in the realm of the four chord. jocking again. Then I decided to make this kind of shift from... Now my fingers are already in this attitude of something with something belt behind it. So I just substitute. And then we have to make a scale run. sharp then these runs sequence and now we're almost there I don't know about you but when I have a sequence like this where it's it's a little bit like a maze this part took a while to learn. I did it all by ear. The way I did this actually was uh, to download a MIDI file into Logic and slow it way down and just learn it note by note, part by part. I could have read it, but I would have had to have transposed some sheet music into B and I just, I want to get it organically by listening and internalizing it and seeing what the keys are and where we are. So we had... Uh, so I worked on this phrase probably more than any phrase in the whole piece. So we're jocking. It does three times. And then it becomes very insistent. We trace all those notes that we've had up from F sharp. And then he really repeats C sharp. And then we... So it's as if saying we're, we're between something now. It's, we have something above and below. But this C sharp is going to be a big, a big part of everything right now.
twice, and then three of these, and then one more to say goodbye, and then one, one to have something above and something below again. So that was, um, one, two, three, one, two, three, twice, three, and then and then we're into the end. One, two, three, one, two, three, twice, one, two, three, and then he says goodbye to the triad uh, right there at the end. Then we get minor, major, and we're going to go through everybody chromatically. I usually shift there. So I'm looking at F sharp, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, then I usually switch, switch to the fifth string, uh, fifth, seventh, ninth fret, sorry, eight, second string, and now we're back at the end, and it's as if this B note, which was this B note, has finally made it up home, and we're going to celebrate with chord in second inversion, F sharp, D sharp, B, and we're home. It's just as if the whole piece in Shankarian analysis terms, the whole piece is a prolongation of this chord becoming that chord. I hope you've enjoyed this little walkthrough, informal walkthrough. If you've lasted this long, God bless you. It's amazing. I do appreciate your kind attention. I hope this has brought you something, some look into the process of learning this piece. It's been really fun. And what used to seem like a bunch of little things now feels more and more like a connected whole. I'm still working on it. It's a pleasure to play it. I play it much better when the camera's not on, just for my own pleasure. I hope this finds you very well, and of course I wish you a very good day.